In this first session on Perspective Dispatch, we'll introduce you to the application, showing you how to navigate and configure the appearance of the interface, as well as how to efficiently use the application as a part of your daily duties. A major change with this version of Dispatch is that it is now a separate application outside of Perspective. With that being said, it's still very much tied to Perspective in many ways, starting with the login process. From the launch page, select the Dispatch application, and in the window that opens, enter your prospective username and password to log in. Once in the application, we can see in the top left-hand corner of the window your default operational zone. Operational zones are a new concept with this Dispatch application. These will be used in conjunction with working zones and teams as a way to segregate data and responsibility within Dispatch, something we'll talk more about in just a few minutes. The toolbar displays icons that will allow you to perform a variety of functions from creating dispatches, updating details, reviewing location information, and more. The Dispatches panel will display any existing dispatches in a variety of states, which can include those that are newly created and unassigned to those that have been cleared but not closed. The Officers panel will list all of the on-duty officers, and we'll see very shortly. From here, you can also bring additional officers on duty or take them off duty. The Maps panel will allow you to visualize the location of your dispatches and officers. And finally, the Messages panel will display any messages, notes, or conversations that you're involved in. We'll see this feature in use briefly in this video, but we'll spend more time looking at it in Dispatch Part 2. From a configuration standpoint, you're not locked into the current appearance. Some of the options you have to alter the look and layout include resizing. Each panel can be resized by clicking and dragging the edges to the appropriate size. Further to that, within each panel, you can also click and drag the edges of the various columns to increase or decrease the width. And the columns themselves can also be repositioned by again clicking and dragging them to the desired location. This click and drag functionality also works for the entire panel itself. While undocked, if you hover one of these panels over another section, it will show you where you can then redock it. You can also undock a panel by clicking on the drop down in the top right corner of the window and selecting floating. When using this method though, just note that you cannot redock the window unless you right click on the window header and then select dockable. Another option available from this drop down is auto hide. Auto hide will collapse the window into a tab that appears on the side of the screen. Hovering your mouse over the tab will temporarily reopen it. Clicking on a different panel will collapse that window back down. To disable the auto hide feature, click on the drop down again and reselect auto hide. The hide function within the drop down acts as a close. If you happen to hide one of these panels to reopen it, you'll have to click on the appropriate icon from the toolbar at the top of the dispatch panel. And then if needed, you can click and drag it into position and redock it back into another location. At any time, if you wish to return back to the default layout, you can click on your name in the top right hand corner and then select Reset Layout. Note that this is also where you can log out of the application. The final configuration topic to discuss is in the settings area. Settings is the administration area of the dispatch application. Much of the administrative functions of the application are now handled right within the application itself. And while all users do have access to the settings, it can be limited. Dispatchers and dispatch reviewers will only see the settings, notifications, and about options. In the user settings, you can adjust the theme, which allows you to change the appearance of the application from this current default appearance to a high contrast appearance. Also here, you can set your default location. Initially, the map may not display your current location. Selecting this will allow you to default where the map will resolve to. In this application, notifications can be used to alert you to various pieces of information, such as new messages, new dispatches, or the expiration of alerts. From the list, select the notification type and then either enable or disable it. For those that are enabled, turn the toast or pop-up type notification on or off. Also, turn on or off the audio notification. If turned on, you can also select the sound and how many times that sound should play. Lastly, in the About section, you can see the basic details of your version of Dispatch, system information, and our technical support contact information. Now, let's look at how to start using Dispatch. 
A change with this version over previous is the segregation of duties and data within the application. This application uses a three-level structure to control what a dispatcher will see and how officers can be used. These three levels are created by your dispatch administrators, and how they are configured will depend on your organization. But in very broad terms, they could be explained as follows. Operational zones could be the large-scale operating areas your security teams monitor. You could have just one operational zone or multiples. If you're a larger or multinational company, these could be the different geographical regions of operation. On a smaller scale, this could be a single campus or building complex, or even just a single building. Each dispatcher will have access to one or more of these operational zones. And for those organizations that do have more than one, a key point to understand is that while your users may have access to multiples, they can only view the dispatches and officers for a single operational zone at a time. Next, within each operational zone, will be smaller subsections called work zones. Again, depending on your organizational structure and areas of operation, you may have one or more work zones. These are where your individual teams will be responding to events. Not the actual physical location of the event, but a designated zone in which the location exists. Examples of work zones could include the different buildings or areas of a campus, or the floors or locations within a single building. One or more teams of officers will be assigned access to respond to events within these zones. This segregation exists because your officers may need to respond to events in one area, but not the other because there's just too much physical space in between the two. The final level, which we just mentioned, are teams. These are groups of officers and could be actual teams, shifts, or whatever your organization deems appropriate. Each team will be assigned to one or more working zones, and when officers are brought on duty, they must be assigned to a team. So, the key to understanding this structure is that the operational zone is used to control your view of information to just your area of responsibility. And within that operational zone are smaller working zones, where your events will be occurring. And in order for an officer to be assigned to a task or dispatched to an event, the team they belong to must have access to the working zone where the event is occurring. Let's look at how to bring our officers on duty and see how some of the structure works. Bringing an officer on duty can be done from either the existing officers panel or by clicking the officers button from the main toolbar. After clicking the on duty button, another window will open. By default, the panel on the left will display the officers whose default operational zone matches the selected operational zone that you have in the top left hand corner of the dispatch screen. Clicking the show all button may display more officers. If so, these would be the individuals that have access to the operational zone, but where it's not set as their default. If this list of officers is rather large, in the search field, you can type the name of the officer to further filter the list. Beside each displayed officer is a call sign and team field. Your dispatch administrators may have set default values for these various officers. If so, a check mark will appear to the right of the team value. If not, an asterisk will indicate that this information needs to be updated prior to the officer being brought on duty. To bring a single officer on duty, select them, ensure they have a call sign and team assigned, and then click the in or right pointing arrow. To bring multiple officers on duty at a single time, ensure all officers have their call sign and team values defined, and then press and hold the shift or control keys to select the multiple officers, and then again click the in or right pointing arrow to bring them on duty. Officers could be taken off duty as well from this window by selecting the officer or officers with the shift and control keys and then clicking the out or left pointing arrow. We can see that from the officers panel there is also an off duty button and this can be used as well, but this method can only be used for a single officer at a time. Before we look at creating dispatches, we'll quickly talk about organizations. In this application, you'll need to make a list of potential organizations that could be dispatched, similar to a favorites list. This will allow for a much faster selection in the dispatch process. Clicking the Organizations button will open a new window, which displays any already added organizations. If there is a need to add more, in the search field, type the name of the organization, such as Fire Department or Police Department, and once found, select it to add it to the list. This isn't something that will have to be done on a regular basis. Organizations will stay listed here unless another user were to remove them. Now, let's look at creating a new dispatch, starting with all of the required fields for the creation of dispatches. 
Start by clicking the Create button in the main toolbar. Something we haven't talked about yet, but have seen, is that this application utilizes an autosave feature. As you enter data on the following fields, a check mark will appear beside the field indicating that that information has been saved. At a minimum, once all of the required fields have data entered on them, the dispatch could be created. Various shortcuts are available to speed up the creation of dispatches, including the use of dispatch templates that can autofill much of this detail. We'll look at creating a few different dispatches to show you all of this functionality. But we'll start by creating a dispatch right from scratch so we can look at the different data fields you may encounter. The first field for data entry is the work zone. As discussed earlier, this is the area in which the event is occurring. If your dispatch administrator has defaulted a work zone on your dispatch user account, this field will auto-populate with that value. But you can still change it to another work zone if or when required. The call category indicates the type of event that is taking place. Selecting this can be done a couple of ways. In the search field, begin to type the code that is associated with the category value, and then select it when displayed, or type the name of the category value. This can be from any of the three levels, and then select it. And the third method could be the manual selection of the values from the various drop-down fields. The priority field may auto-populate based off of the call category value selected but if this is still blank, select the most appropriate value for the event. Moving back up towards the top of the screen, we can see that we must indicate the dispatch location. This is another significant change over previous versions of dispatching, where the location was selected from the four-level site rollup. You can still see those values, but now you can type the name of location to search it to make that possible selection. These can also include, as we'll see, indoor locations, which could be used to display floor plans to better direct officers to the specific location of the event. When typing the name of a location in the search field, a list of matches may appear below and could be displayed in one of three colors. The light blue indicates existing or previously used dispatch locations. Medium blue are indoor locations. The darkest color indicates prospective site rollup values that have not previously been selected and are not yet a location within dispatch. Once the location appears, select it from the list, and we'll see in a later example, new locations could be created on the fly as well, if needed. Another new feature I just mentioned are indoor locations. If these have been identified and added, then clicking the indoor locations button will allow you to browse through the structure and possible floor plans to select the specific location of where the event is occurring. Double clicking on this will allow you to indicate a location point for the officer to go to. Coming back to the remaining dispatch details, next we can select the appropriate call source, indicate the initiated by person if this person is known. If you know the contact number from the initiated by person or the call source, you can enter that as well. Then a description for the event, and in the initiated notes field, this could be used in a couple of different ways. Once the dispatch is created, this initial note will appear in the messages panel and could represent a message or note that is related to the dispatch. This and any other added messages will be transferred to the activity notes of the activity data form once the dispatch is closed and this record is transferred to perspective. This note could also be used as a starting point of a conversation between the dispatcher and the officer that's assigned to the tasks for this event. Finally, at the bottom of the window is the ability to create specific tasks that the responding officer must complete in order to complete and close the dispatch. We'll see that these tasks are not necessarily required at this point, and they can be created on the fly. But an important change in this version of dispatch over previous is that officers are no longer dispatched to the event, but to one or more of the tasks that are associated with the dispatch. To add a task, click the Add button, and then enter a description of the task. If needed, select the location, but this should auto-populate from the dispatch location already selected. And finally, if you know which officer this task should be assigned to, in the Assign to Tasks field, search for and select the officer. If you're not sure which officer will be assigned to the task at this time, this can be assigned later on, something that we'll look at in another example. Once all of the known details have been entered, click the Create button to add this event to the Dispatches panel. Once clicked, you'll notice that the fields will then clear, but the window will remain open. This allows you to begin entering a new dispatch if needed, or, with this in mind, you could choose to dock this window to the interface to keep it open, drag it to another monitor to keep it open, or close it and re-click that Create button again later on next time you need to create a dispatch. 
Now we can see the dispatch is visible in the dispatches panel, and when selected, the map will resolve to that location. In the messages panel, if an initial note was added, we could see that here. And as mentioned, we'll take a closer look at the messages in our dispatch part two session. RTAs, or recommended time to act, may also be visible within the dispatches window. These alerts can help dispatchers and responders stay on top of process and react in a timely manner to certain events. RTAs will have times associated to them. For example, there could be an RTA that exists for dispatching states of new to assigned for five minutes. This basically means that a dispatcher should be able to assign an available officer to a task on the dispatch within five minutes of its creation. If the time expires before the officer is assigned, a notification may alert the dispatchers to the expiration of that RTA, and the time elapsed will begin to flash, all prompting the dispatcher to react as soon as possible. RTAs can exist for various dispatch states. Hovering over the RTA in the dispatches panel allows you to view the details of the existing RTA. These are created by your dispatch administrators, so if you have any questions regarding what may be set up in your system, it would be best to direct your questions to them. When ready to indicate that an officer has started the task, either in the dispatches panel or the officers panel, select the task and click the start button at the bottom of the window. In the same manner, once our officer arrives on scene, we can indicate this by clicking the button or right clicking and selecting arrive, again in either the dispatches or officer panels. If there's a need to dispatch an organization, select the dispatch and then click on the dispatch organization button and in the search field, type the name of that organization and select it. Alternately, you can also right click on the dispatch, select dispatch organization and then select the appropriate one. Now let's take a look at the creation of dispatches just a couple more times. This time seeing how to create a new location and officer tasks on the fly. We'll start by filling out some of the basic dispatch details. Now when it comes to adding the location, instead of searching for the existing location, zoom in to the appropriate level on the map. Click the Add button in the search box, and then right click on the map to indicate its location. In the search field, enter the name for that location to create it. Just note that for consistency in your data, creating locations on the fly should only be done when absolutely necessary or if this is an identified process that should be followed as per your dispatch administrators. We'll leave our tasks blank for now and just start this dispatch. As mentioned, tasks can be created on the fly in one of two ways. If you know what the task or tasks are that need to be completed, single click on the dispatch and then click the task button from the main toolbar. A new window will open where you can add the task descriptions and assign an officer if known. Again, if the officer is unknown at this point, you can leave that field blank. Expanding the tasks for the dispatch now shows us that we have an unassigned task. When we know which officer we need to assign this task, we can either click and drag the officer to that task, click on assign officer, or we can right click on the task and select the officer. The other method for creating tasks on the fly is to click and drag an officer to a dispatch. This will then create and assign a generic default respond and assist task for that particular officer. As mentioned a little while ago, templates can be used to speed up the creation of dispatches. These templates must first be created in the settings area by your dispatch administrators. For a final look at creating a dispatch, let's take a look at how these templates work and just how fast this process can be.